You were involved in the early 80s in uh, quite a bit of controversy with the band Judas Priest. And the claim, I think, was that they had backwards messages in their rock music that led to some unfortunate outcomes. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, it was the uh, late 80s, early 90s, actually, I believe. Early 90s, wasn't it? I thought it was 82. No, no, that was much, much earlier. That was with uh, a pastor from California. Oh, uh, okay. So the, the trial with Judas Priest was actually, I think, in the early 1990s. Uh -huh. um, so what had happened... Uh, the general story is the um, two young men, two days before Christmas, uh, were sitting uh, in their basement of one of their houses, uh, drinking beer, smoking marijuana, and listening to Jesus Priest. And the um, all afternoon. And then at the end of the afternoon, they uh, picked up a shotgun, walked to a local church playground that had swings and theater daughters and that kind of thing. Uh, proceeded to sit down on the swings or a bench, and I can't remember the details now, and attempted to commit suicide. One of them succeeded. Mm. The other just blew his face off, but managed to survive. Wow. In the hospital, immediately after, when the police asked him, why did you do this? Uh, the response of the survivor was, life sucks. Which is a, not an uncommon response among uh, teenagers, as they were. Mm -hmm. um, but the parents then, a, a few years later, actually decided to sue. But they didn't decide to sue the gun manufacturer. They didn't decide to sue the, the uh, brewery that provided the beer or the, the uh, place that sold it. They didn't decide to go after the drug um, dealers who had sold them the marijuana. No, they decided to go after Judas Priest and CBS Records. So that's what the suit was lodged against. About alleged uh, subliminal content of two kinds. Backward messages, so the messages that you hear the forward message as normal uh, language, but play backwards, it has a, a completely different meaning. And some forward subliminals, so low-level forward messages. Okay, so the parents thought that there were messages in the music of Judas Priest that was the cause of their um, sons to commit suicide. Right, it was the, it was the, uh, the straw that broke the camel's back. Okay. Oh, okay. So they may have been okay. depressed for other reasons, and yep. drinking and smoking marijuana is going to yep. be somewhat depressive as well. Um, and that this was, had it not been for the backward messages in the music and the, and the forward subliminals, they, their argument was they wouldn't do it. Now, that wasn't their idea. They came to this because of, uh, I suspect, media yep. exposure about other bands. So Ozzy Osbourne had been sued yep. um, for the same kinds of things, although in his case it was all forward messages, uh, in a song called Suicide Solutions. Uh, which in fact was a, uh, a song against suicide, but ironically enough, he was sued for that. And in his case, they just threw it out of court because the, the, the free speech amendment of the American Constitution protects speech. Yep. The judge let, in this current trial, the Jewish priest trial, let it go forward because, he argued, um, the, the backward messages, the ones that you would only hear in the forward direction, which would be innocuous rock commentary, um, uh, were messages you couldn't protect yourself against because you weren't aware you were hearing them. Mm, okay. So therefore, the 14th Amendment of the American Constitution didn't apply. That sounds like a reasonable claim to me. That's, that's, assuming that's there a are good such judgment. Messages, yeah, yeah. Assuming there are such messages and assuming they affect you. Right? Um, so that was his, his... That's why the trial went forward. Yeah. And Because people were asking, well, given the president of Ozzy, Os the president of Ozzy Osbourne, why are we going through with this trial? Yep. Now, my involvement then was after that. So I received a phone call because of work I'd done back in the early 80s, I received a phone call from the head lawyer for Judas Priest and CBS Records. It was actually a whole firm of lawyers uh, in Reno, California, which is where the trial was going to take place. It's about a year before the trial. I received this phone call um, because of the work I'd done on backward messages and rock music with Don Reed, a colleague of mine then at the University of Lethbridge, yep. that we'd done in response to this pastor from California coming to town and holding these big rallies about uh, backward messages in rock music uh, that were leading young people um, down the path of life such as sex and drug use. And he claimed it was because of the backward messages in the rock music. It led to a big um, rally at the end of his two days there where people showed up and broke records and things like this. Um, it was quite the cause celebrity in, in uh, Lethbridge. I was a brand new professor in 1982. I just arrived in Lethbridge. Um, and so I got a phone call back then um, from a local announcer of a rock station 
Ian Lesbridge calling me up after Pastor Gary Greenwald had arrived, saying, is there anything in psychology that we could use to speak about this alleged uh, backward messages in rock music, or subliminal messages, they were calling them? And I turned to my colleague, Don Reed. Um, we both went, not that we're aware of. And uh, we did a little research, but we couldn't find anything on backward messages. But you were initially skeptical of the claim that, that backwards messages could influence, or, or well, you were open to the idea that they could? Moderately, or mi I guess minimally, to be honest. But what I did do is I then went to his presentations yeah. to see what he was doing that was leading so many people to be so upset about it. Because I it was see. the front page of the newspapers, all the yeah, radio okay. stations and so on. So I went to one of his, actually went more, more, more than one of his rallies, to find out what he was doing. And on the basis of what he was doing, it seemed to be pretty clear um, that there really wasn't the effect that he thought it was going on, um, but rather just some standard psychological phenomena that, that we were well aware of, old, old phenomena in psychology. So it was on that basis then <clears throat> that Don Reed and I said, but to be fair, we should run some research. Yep. Right? But this is a claim nobody's investigated. Yep. Uh, he's, he was earnest. It wasn't like he was just a con man or something. He was actually earnest, as far as I know he still is. He actually believes this, this is true. And so we decided, well, fair, fair enough. Right? Now his claim, and it, it's more subtle than most people think, so when it really hit the press in the, in the mid-'80s, um, uh, people had the wrong idea of what, in fact, he was claiming. So his concern is not that, there, that um, uh, messages are being inserted in rock music, because obviously the forward messages in many rock songs right, are, are promote drug Quite use dark, and, yes. right? yep, yep. and the like. So that wasn't his concern. His concern was, that, as he rephrased it at one of his meetings, I'm paraphrasing now, um, is that, well, good Christian teenagers with a forward message would hear it, understand it, and reject it. And, yeah. But his concern was this, it's much more subtle. And to be fair, I thought that the guy deserves a shake because he's not just thinking very glibly about this stuff. His concern was that because it was backwards and it's hard to register consciously, if the message was still getting through, the meaning of the backward version of the message was getting through, then they would be unaware of the source. They wouldn't be able to attribute it to the record. Yep. But if the thought popped into their head by some unconscious mechanism, yep. he never specified what that would be, but if it did, then they would have a message in their head with no attributable source except themselves. Yep. And so they couldn't protect themselves against it. Exactly. So they would now be looking at uh, thinking, oh, uh, uh, it's fun to smoke marijuana, must be my idea. Yep. Not. That's because they, they would reject it, he claimed, if somebody just walked up to them and said, hey, bud, it's fun to smoke marijuana. Yep. Right? They could reject it, but because it's popped into their head, apparently, without any source, yep. it must be their idea. Yep. Or even a message from a higher power. Or, he, okay, <laughs> let's not go there. But, so that was his argument. So that, I watched what he did. And what he would do is he would walk in uh, with uh, sections of, of uh, rock music that he must have spent hundreds of hours obtaining listening to all this rock music backwards and finding these passages. And he's found quite a few, so he's got quite a demonstration. At the time, you could actually write to him and he would send you full cassette tapes of all the examples he dug up to that point um, and then more. So what he would do is he would then come in, he'd say, okay, this is, this is for example, um, Queen, another one bites the dust, and he'd play a passage of Queen's another one bites the dust in the forward direction, and it sound perfectly fine to you, a uh, famous song. And then he said, oh, here's the same section I'm going to play it backwards, and I want you to listen for, and in this particular example, it's, it's fun to smoke marijuana. And he plays the passage for you backwards, and sure enough, everybody starts laughing, because everybody hears it. We use it as a classroom demonstration now. Uh, and it's quite apparent. You know, it's quite apparent, yes, it sounds like that, sort of, mm -hmm. but it's like visual illusions. You're also aware at the same time that it isn't really like that, yep. right? So it's it's got those two levels going on at the same time. But it, you could go, yeah, okay, I see what you mean, right? It does sound like it's fun to smoke marijuana. And he's many other examples like that. But that's his procedure. And he just comes in for about an hour, says, here's another passage I want you to listen for, then plays it. And by the time he's done, after about an hour, people are totally convinced. All these backward messages, I heard them all when he asked okay. me to, to hear them. So every time he tells you what to listen, what to for, listen for, and then you hear the tape. Then, then you hear the tape, okay. yeah. Here backwards. So we thought, okay, he's got a theory. He's got, a, he's got an explanation of why he's concerned that if, if it did manage to get in without you being aware of, its, of the source, that, that in fact could be of some concern. Um, so we thought, and there's no research, so why don't we actually see if you can influence people's behavior by the meaning of the, uh, the, the back, sorry, the, the semantic content of the backward message when you're hearing the, the passage forward. 
Yep. So the, the semantic content, the, the words. Yeah, they're, yeah. so they, they're, they're, something about their behavior is going to be influenced consistent with the meaning of the backward passage. Okay, cool. Yeah. But they're not hearing the backward passage. That's the point. They're going to hear it in the forward direction. Now, what we didn't do was use rock music because we thought that just makes the task harder. We got all this other noise going on. Um, we, in fact, didn't study anything satanic. Um, all the headlines afterwards talked about us studying backward messages and rock music. We did nothing of the sort. <laughs> um, so what we did do is... We took sentences, normal sentences, that had various properties we were interested in investigating, English sentences, um, and then averted them. So the logic, if you could follow me for a moment. So we play the, the message, the, the, the passage backwards, because we know what it's... Yep. So the forward meaning is not the backward meaning, if you follow me. Yep. Okay. So in the forward direction, they're just hearing backward speech. Yep. Um, which is, yeah, yeah, right? That's what it sounds like. And then um, we asked various questions. So I'll get back to Jews pretty shortly. <laughs> so this, this is good. We, um, we started with some really, really simple questions. So what can people do with backward speech? And some of the questions we asked came about because both Don and I, Don Reed and I, when we first started playing with these sentences, we went, those are very speech-like. So when you turn speech around, well, English in particular, what we were using, you turn that around, it still sounds like speech. Mm. But it sounds like a foreign language you don't know. Right? Um, now to us, and because the Muppet Show was on at the time, um, to us it sounded like the Swedish chef on the Muppet, shows, Muppet Show, uh, because neither of us know Swedish. That later came to um, bite us uh, when a uh, Global Mail reporter completely misinterpreted what I was saying and said that Voki and Reed claimed that all rock music would play backwards sound Swedish, like, yeah. which is not quite <laughs> what we were claiming. Uh, anyway. So we decided to explore that because it's speech-like. Maybe there's a bunch of things that you already have the skills because you're, most of us are well-skilled at language and speech that we could still do. So the very first thing we asked is, so we were playing the passages backwards and we just had some recorded by women and some recorded by men. And we just asked them when they're hearing the backwards, is that a man or a woman? And they were virtually perfect in scoring that. So they could mm -hmm. easily tell the gender of the speaker. Uh, it wasn't quite 100% because one person meant to tick one box and tick the other box. Sure. So otherwise, we would have 100%. So clearly, they, you can tell gender. That's not too surprising, because women tend to have higher frequency voices than men, and play backwards, the frequencies remain. Mm -hmm. So the next one we tried, well, we tried all sorts of things, but the, a few, I'll hit a few highlights. Um, we then wanted to see if they could, uh, for example, determine what language the person was speaking. So we had a uh, fluent trilingual in German, French, and English, okay. who... Um, we got all these passages, and we had him translate them, um, because I'm barely unilingual. And so what he would do is translate the English sentence into its equivalent in French and its equivalent in German. Yeah. And then he'd, he'd read them all in, in the normal fashion, and then we turned them all backwards. And so the meaning hasn't changed, just the language used is changing. And we, asked, we told people what we'd done, and we said, now it's up to you to decide whether when we play a passage to you, which of the three is it? Yep. Uh, for any given passage, by chance alone, you'd expect them to hit it correctly a third of the time, and they were well, they were up well over 60%. So not as well as they could do with the gender judgment, but so remarkably quite, we thought it was remarkable uh, that they could do that well in nailing what the language was, even though they're hearing it backwards probably for the first time. For many of these people, they've never heard anything backwards before, and yet they could still tell the language. Um, we didn't explore the exact details as to why that's true, but if you just think about some of the sounds in the language, you can probably in your head figure out, well, that kind of guttural sound backwards would sound. Listening. So we're probably going to um, uh, link to that paper, but can you, can you summarize what the, what the maybe four or five things that people could and couldn't pick up when they were backwards? That's about what they could do yep. <laughs> uh, on those. So that's about as far as you could get. And then we tried, and those are, uh, notice we're not even asking anything about the meaning. At this point, we're just asking physical properties of the tape. Gotcha. Right? So people could detect uh, male from female. They could detect language in some way. And is that it? Well, we tried some things we thought would work that were strictly physical, like a uh, question or declarative statement. Because we thought, well, people would realize that normally when you hear a question, the end of the sentence goes up, yep. as in valley speak. Um, and that, therefore, if you heard a sentence start by going down, sweeping downward, you should recognize this probably a question. Yep. But couldn't do it. Can't do questions. Could, couldn't okay. even do that. Um, then we tried, again, something that should be relatively simple, starting to move toward meaning. 
we took sentences um, and read them as they were or read them scrambled. So yep. one is meaningful, the other's not, one, the other's nonsense, and simply ask, we're not asking at all what the meaning is, just merely tell us if one is meaningful or nonsense. Yep. And uh, they couldn't do that either. Okay. And so then we started to move into more direct questions about the actual meaning. Can you get the meaning at all? Um, and if we ask direct questions, so what would that mean if you heard it in the forward direction? Zip. Right? Even if we made it a two alternative first choice task. It either means this or this, which of the two? <laughs> Couldn't do it. So we, we play the backward, we play it. So we knew what the forward meaning was. We had ones that were matched, so they had the same meaning, but we changed how we expressed it. Passive voice versus active voice, for example. Yeah. So they have exactly the same meaning, but their superficial structure changes. They couldn't even tell that when we had to listen to the backwards. So the bottom line is people aren't very good at picking up the, the meaning or the words in very simple messages when they're played backwards. backwards. No, okay. yeah, when they're, when they're hearing them backward. No, okay. so you, this is difficult to do. Here. Tell, tell me, <laughs> tell me what the okay. bottom line is. Yeah. They're hearing the, the, uh, the, the forward sentence backwards. Yep. The meaning they're going for is the meaning the forward sentence would, ha would have had. In fact, that's what, it's, what they're told. If you heard this in the forward direction, what would oh, it, it mean? Or yep. other kinds of matching tasks. But remember, none of those are in fact what uh, Greenwald was arguing. He said it was a conscious process. It was conscious recollec the recollection of what was being heard or what was being played but unconscious, mm -hmm. and all our tasks are asking you directly, what does that mean? Um, and he made no statements about that. He didn't say people were consciously. In fact, his concern would be, had they been so, he wouldn't be concerned if they could consciously experience it. So we then went to indirect tests, as they're called, or tests where it's not necessary that the person be consciously aware of, of uh, what they're hearing, um, but that can still be expressed in their behavior. And we did a series of tasks like that, um, a varying sensitivity according to the literature uh, for normal speech or normal tasks. And uh, they couldn't do any of them. Even indirect measures of the content of the messages didn't come through. So, for example, simple things um, such as trying to influence their spelling um, by pre exposing them to uh, particular meanings of, of homophones. So, hom that we used homophone pairs that had a high frequency and low frequency interpretation. That means one of them, if I just said it to you, that's the only spelling you'd think of. So, if I said read to you, yep. you don't think of marshes. Yep. Right? Gotcha. You think of books. Yeah. Uh, but so, R E E D is the low frequency spelling, R E A D is yep. the high frequency spelling. So, we, we, we actually copied an experiment that had been done with uh, people suffering from a syndrome known as Korsakoff syndrome in which they have great difficulty learning anything new. They're fine for the past, but they can't learn anything new. And when they were exposed to uh, sentences like, climbing a mountain is a remarkable feat, with F-E-A-T at the end, that's the low frequency interpretation, they'd have that conversation with the whole bunch of homophones included, and a whole bunch of non-homophones as well to kind of disguise the task. And then they'd be asked um, the next day, the experimenter would come back the next day and say, um, okay, I'm, I'm going to give you a memory test for words I talked to you about yesterday, and of course their response was, we talked to you yesterday. Hmm. So that's got a complete chance on the recognition test. But then she'd say, well, I'm going to give you a spelling test, not mention anything about the past. And the spelling test would have some of the homophones that had been biased towards the low frequency interpretation, others that hadn't as controls. And so what they should do is the ones that were biased towards the low frequency interpretation, if the memory was there, they should circle them, they should select them. Okay. And otherwise, this should select a high frequency interpretation. It's exactly what was found okay. with people with uh, Korsakoff okay. deficits. So we're probably going to go through the whole of the methodology of, of your experiments. Okay. But what did you find? Um, well, then, so we took that very, very basic idea and repeated it with backward messages. Yep. Otherwise, it's identical. Okay. Okay? Everything's the same, except we just turned all the, message, all the, all the sentences backwards first. Yep. Gotcha. That's it. Okay. And then give them a spelling test. Nothing. Completely a chance. They showed what they did is, in fact, for all homophones, whether they were pre exposed or not, backwards, they uh, chose the high frequency spelling, so as what, you would predict. Okay. So even something as subtle as that, which works with people who have no explicit memory yeah. for the task, uh, they still show this in their behavior. People given backward messages in the exact same experiment, exact same kind of paradigm, do not. So people given backwards messages were, were or were not influenced by? Completely uninfluenced. 
So if, if you to put that, I don't want to put it in my words. What what was the what was the bottom line of that experiment? So people given we found no uh, effect either conscious or unconscious, direct or indirect, on their behavior uh, from backward messages. In, uh, as far as we could tell, none of the meaning of backward messages was getting through. None. Okay. Even in very very subtle experiments. So given so you've created an experiment with extreme amount of scientific rigor, you've found very little evidence for the fact that backwards not. messages, not, okay, you found no evidence for backwards messaging influencing people uh, either consciously or unconsciously. So presumably people uh, then just read your study and reacted positively to it and the court case was thrown out? Is that what happened? No, we hadn't got to the court case yet. So what happened is Don Reed and I presented, because it had happened in our community, we asked to do a public presentation at the public library for the community to find to explain what we'd found. Because the concern was still going on about yeah. this terrible thing about these insidious messages in rock music. Some states had banned um, backward messages in rock music. The government was considering uh, requiring stickers to be placed on all rock albums, warning about backward right. subliminal content. You can imagine what happened at that point if you were a rock band. Wouldn't you want the sticker? Mm -hmm. What 14 year old boy could resist? <laughs> Satanic messages, oh boy. Um, so what happened after that point, of course, is that many rock bands started putting backward messages in their, in their music. And they're easy to tell. Unlike the, the ones where it's kind of a, you know, you can barely get the message to work it out when you hear it backwards. They, these were very clean ones. So they'd put it, start telling stories backwards. So you hear it on the record as, as the, the backward speech, but if you turned it around and played it, it was very clear. And so Pink Floyd did it, the Beatles did it, many, many bands started doing it. Uh, precisely because you'd sell more records if you could claim you had backward messages in there. Um, so the first effect of us presenting at the, the public library is it went over the wires. They had wires in those days, called the wires. Um, and we got interviewed by everybody. We were on every talk show you could imagine, um, right around North America, and including Australia um, and uh, the UK and so on, for about a year. It was just all everywhere. It was just constant. And we eventually wrote it up, both the research and our experience with it, because virtually every report we read after we'd go for an interview or a reporter would call us up or even on a, we were on a talk show, the report of it would always get it all wrong. Okay. <laughs> so uh, we eventually published a paper in 1985 that explained our research and, and what had happened with the media, that they really couldn't understand these very simple messages. So one of the biggest mistakes they would make is to say that we had found that you could have people uh, hear anything you wanted to just by suggesting it. Yep. Now, in fact, we had conducted one of the major pieces of our research was a set of experiments precisely to show that that wasn't true, mm -hmm. that you can't make people hear or see whatever you want anything. them to hear or see. The, the, the thing they're, they're hearing or seeing has to at least be consistent in some way. So, for example, I could point to a cloud out there and, and oh, look, it's a bunny rabbit and it was just a round cloud, you'd go, oh, I'm sorry, what, a bunny rabbit sleeping? I'm not sure what you're getting at, right? But you would have no question at all if it had two big protuberances at some point, right? Gotcha. Same thing has to happen with the, with the backward messages. It has to at least be consistent. So we designed a series of experiments where we actually took passages um, and flipped them around and then listened and listened and listened, much like Greenwald had done with his original demonstrations. And constructed little bits that fit certain passages yeah. of, these, of these particular tapes. And what, so we had two different um, passages. We had uh, Jabberwocky, because it makes no sense forward or backward. What's Jabberwocky? The, the Twas Brillig and the Slithy Toves, the Gyre and Gibble in the Wabe, um, and on. And then we also took the 23rd Psalm, because Greenwald had claimed that uh, no religious um, passages had backward messages in them. Okay. And so then Don Reed and I got together in good scientific fashion at his place because he had the better stereo. I, I recorded one of the passages and flipped it backwards, and then Don Reed recorded the other one and flipped, flipped it backwards so we could control for voice, intonation. And uh, then we just listened to them very creatively. Uh, to help that process, we used a case of beer. And had to send out for more, actually. Um, eventually, we managed to construct six messages, if you want, for one the six messages for, say, the 23rd Psalm, and another completely independent six yep. for Jabberwocky. And here's the, the basic experiment was then was this. If we completely, so I always played the whole passage to, uh, this was a class of um, 
introductory students and another class of uh, cognition students in the second year cognition course. And so we'd play, always play the entire passage of either Jabberwocky or the 23rd Psalm to them. Um, and then we'd say, then we'd ask them, okay, I want you to listen for, and we'd either choose something that we had, we had constructed to be consistent with that passage, or we'd borrow a phrase from the other passage that wasn't consistent. That wasn't consistent, okay. And we'd say, listen for, and we'd give them the passage, and then they'd hear the whole um, to our, either 23rd Psalm or Jabberwocky, um, and we'd record how often they actually said they thought they heard it. And basically the results were almost perfectly, not exactly perfect, but almost perfectly, that if it was one we'd chosen, or, sorry, one we constructed for that particular passage, uh, then they would say they heard it. If it was one that we borrowed from the alternative passage, they would say they didn't hear it. Indicating that it has to at least be consistent to the extent that uh, Don Reed and I were able to construct semi-meaningful phrases. Yeah. As I said, the, the uh, scientific beer meant we were sometimes more creative than probably was good. So some of the passages, when you, we just hear what we chose, don't make a lot of sense, but they're, they're consistent. Yep. So one of the ones that we use in class all the time as a demonstration, you saw a girl with a weasel in her mouth, that's what Don Reed and I came up with, and it does actually fit, but it doesn't make a lot of sense. Yep. And, and you won't hear that if we play the 23rd Psalm backward. Okay. You won't hear that particular passage, but you will hear it if we play the Jabberwocky backwards. So that showed that it's not, we can't get you to hear just anything, it has to at least be consistent with the passage contrary to what most media reports would, would uh, conclude that we had found. So that's the background. I published the paper in 85. Come the early 90s, and we, I get the phone call from the lawyers for Judas Priest in Reno, Nevada, where the trial is going to take place. This is a civil suit. And the plaintiffs have filed for millions of dollars, by the way, in damages. Um, and so she calls me up and says, uh, you're the only authorities on this. Nobody else has ever published a paper on backward messages, and they were claiming there were a number of backward subliminals in uh, this particular album, the Stained Class album by Judas Priest. And I said, oh, okay, that's, that's fine. I'm more than happy to serve as an expert for you. I'll provide you all the research I can get for you and other kinds of things. And she says, well, we don't, yeah, thank you very much. It's very nice, but we, no, we want you to come and testify for us. And I said, well, hmm, there's a problem. And she goes, what, what, what problem? I said, you, I said, you probably want my co-author to do this job. Uh, he's actually had experience in court as an expert witness, not in this domain, but uh, in eyewitness testimony. Um, and she said, no, no, you're the first author. We have to have you. And I said, well, I'll tell you what. I only agree to do all this and come to the trial if you bring a, my colleague with me. And she said, yeah, fine, no big deal. And so a year, or almost a year. She calls me you know, once, twice a week. We talk about things, how are things going, and so on. She says, okay, so you know, you're ready, you're getting, thinking about your testimony, this kind of stuff. And, well, as I said, I think you really want my colleague. So here's what happens. The day of, we're flying down there for the first weekend meeting, of actual face-to-face -face meeting. Now, the reason I was reticent, and I'd actually told her, is that I actually look like one of the band members. Um, shaggy, long, blonde hair. <laughs> Um, and the judge is known for having somewhat uh, less than positive attitude toward um, people who look like me. And she says, oh, not a problem, don't worry about it. So the day we were fly down to meet the uh, team and Judas Priest, uh, Don Reed was leaving from, I think it was Vancouver, and he got there earlier to Reno than I did from Lethbridge. So I'm the last to arrive. And I, it's about five in the afternoon, and I go to the cabin big law firm, and I go in there, and there's a big meeting room with these big old doors, and open, very, very yeah. dramatic entry. And I come walking in, and there's this woman I've been talking to her for years. She's the head lawyer. There's all the other lawyers. There's Judas Priest around the table. There's Don sitting there. And I go walking in, and she looks up at me, and she goes, oh, my God. <laughs> and then says, now, Don, when you're on the stand. <laughs> so I actually didn't testify at the Judas Priest trial. Wow. Well, you want to. This is good. You had a good backup plan. Yeah, so... Uh, but I did get to meet um, various characters in this long story of, of uh, subliminal messaging. Um, so uh, Wilson Brian Key, for example, was there to testify for the plaintiffs. Yeah. Um, so I got to meet him, and we spent some time talking. I had a lot of fun, actually speaking. Uh, not intentionally, I don't think, <laughs> but <laughs> it's quite funny. Uh, he used to be a professor at uh, Western Ontario okay. University, um, and then left in the 1970s. 
um, because of all the books he'd been publishing on, okay. on so some what of the messaging. The, so what, what happened in the trial? What, what was the outcome? Well, the first outcome was there was a pre-trial hearing where Don Reed presented our evidence about backward messages. This was all we were going to comment on. And the judge said, well, oh, okay. The conclusion is pretty clear. Threw that all out. Mm -hmm. So no longer did back backward messages play any role. However, there had been one forward subliminal they had alleged was uh, on one of the songs, uh, Better By You, Better By You, Better Than Me, on the Stained Class album, um, that the engineers came in, because they had the original, I think there were 14-track, um, original multi-track tapes for this song, and was able to isolate what this alleged forward subliminal was, was if I'm remembering, remembering this correctly, I may not be, that it was a, a um, passing, just a passing light touch of a bass string that wasn't meant to be played at that moment. Um, and then a fraction of a second later, a slight click on the drum kit. Kind of background noise that happens all the time in the recording. While the rest of the band is, you know, making a lot of noise. Um, and so it gives a ooh, -eh, ooh -eh, which they interpreted as do it. Um, not doing much for Nike stocks, I don't think. But <laughs> so the idea was that, that the, the, the plaintiffs alleged that the boys were borderline of drinking beer and talking marijuana and all that kind of stuff. And they heard this message, and they're now making the argument that Greenwald had made, or similar to Greenwald's argument, about backward messages. And that is, is that because it's, it's, you can't really hear it, it's subliminal, or very low volume, on the um, record, that when, it, when they appreciated what they were hearing, do it, they thought it was their own thought. And that's what led them to pick up the, the rifle, uh -huh. go across the street and kill themselves. So that, that's what the case came down to. So at that point, I'm basically out of it. Because it's no longer about subliminal messages. It's about that one forward subliminal. And um, after the testimony of the engineers about the, where they found these noises on the tape, uh, the judge didn't dismiss the case because he thought the whole thing was nonsense. Um, he'd already, remember, ruled that it would, be, it would not be protected by the, the free speech amendment. He dismissed it because, as he argued, there was no evidence that Judas Priest and CBS Records had intended the message to be there. Which is a bit dangerous if you think about it. So that left open a sort of precedent for, for this to not to be resolved. Right, so that if somebody, for example, um, put a low-level subliminal, forward subliminal, yeah. in and intended it to be there. So I don't know how, what the, the state of the, uh, the, the law is now with respect to that ruling, but it was, I thought it was an unusual, somewhat scary ruling yeah. about that. However, so Judas Priest and CBS Records, in a sense, won, except the judge awarded all the costs against them. Because, of course, the families had no money. Oh, wow. But they, they were suing. So they won and lost at the same yeah, time. Yeah, I see. But at least they, they won in the technical sense. Yep. That, that uh, like Ozzy Osbourne, they were at least not convicted of anything mm -hmm. or didn't have to pay the, the lawsuit. Hmm. So that's the story Interesting. of Judas Priest. That's amazing. It seems that people are hearing things that aren't actually there. How is that possible? It's a kind of a two-level answer to that one. The first one is that's all that ever happens. You, it, the world doesn't really look the way you think it looks. Um, as you know, uh, even what you call solid objects are just made up of molecules with big spaces between them. So it doesn't really look like that. There are no colors in the world. Okay. Right? Color is, a, is, a, is a, something you bring to the, to the processing of, of the information you receive. So in some sense, what you just said is always true. Okay. You're never really seeing what's out there. Um, so that's one level of explanation. So in fact, um, hearing things that most other people would argue are not there, or, or seeing things that other people would argue are not there, is not saying much. Because okay. Okay? that's always true. Okay. What I think's meant is to try to dissociate I think what you're asking about from a straight hallucination, when there actually is no input source that should lead to that conclusion about something being out there, yeah. uh, which is usually a result of brain disease or, or um, probably induce it with some chemicals as well, where the, the uh, brain's uh, processing gets quite distorted. And it's actually doing more than just trying to put together a reasonable construction. It actually creates a whole cloth. As, as for example, in people who have had their eyes enucleated, so they're completely blind, but claim they can see. Okay. Um, and you're saying, oh, I'll drive, you know. <laughs> uh, interesting phenomenon. Um, in one particular case, the, the individual uh, 
who they knew could not see because they had no eyes, yeah. but claimed he could. Um, they'd ask him, so how, you know, how many fingers am I holding up? And they wouldn't even hold up any fingers. He'd go three. Confidently. Yeah. What color is my tie? Yellow. Wow. <laughs> no tie on, right? Um, so there's, there's that part of it. So there, there, and there are people who, who suffer from various diseases that in fact lead them to, to really see things that aren't there in the sense that another person standing right there with them is just, there's nothing yeah. there, there's nothing, right? Those are hallucinations though. So what we're talking about in these particular cases where we could lead people to, to think that they heard, I saw a girl with a weasel in her mouth, something a bit different. We've given enough information, much like we do in the real world, it, these aren't threshold phenomena that either is or isn't. It's that your perceptual systems are, systems are accumulating evidence. And then you can also make use of all sorts of biases that you've developed over your lifetime to at some point say, yeah, I'm confident enough to go mm -hmm. with claiming I hear this or see this. Mm -hmm. And later it turns out, oh, it was just the way the blanket was folded. I thought it was, I thought it was my dog in the bed, but it just turns out it was the blanket okay. was folded. But because I expected my dog there, that's what I saw. So that would be not, a, not, not an hallucination. Um, an illusion of a sense of a type, I guess, is the way to think about it. So that's all we're really doing, and that's just standard, normal processing. So we're not, there's nothing unusual happening here. It's, is, just, it's just what we're doing all the time. Is that what they call pareidolia? Some, yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay, it's, you gotta be careful to separate it from hallucinations is the, is the big issue. Okay. Um, I, think, I think the distinction's important. Uh, Oliver Sacks' latest book, he goes out of his way to convince people that it really is important to separate the two. The two, hallucination and pareidolia. Yes, okay. yes, two, that, that they're not. Don't equate one phenomenon with the other and, and don't even think the mechanisms for one are necessarily the same as the other. As is often done where people try to blend the two, the two issues. So yes, that, that's, that's what I'd argue. But I would argue that all perception is pareidolia. That's what we're always doing. We're not really seeing the world as it is. We're, we're just trying to create something that's reasonably predictive of allowing us to act in the world. It's just sometimes we're right in the sense that it, it matches up with... What others would say. With yeah. what others would say in the world yeah. and agree with you versus um, not or did not intend to, to do it. Right. So, say. for example, if you, if you uh, take a normal scene in a room like this and pick out some color, so let's say the color along that wall there, and you might say, well, it's beige. Although I'm sure my wife would have some subtle distinction she'd attach to that. Right? Um, but it's all full of shadows. So in fact, even though you see that all as the same color, if we actually went up and looked at it very, very closely, we'd see, no, well, it's not beige at all. There's purple and blue over there. And there's, think of somebody who, an artist, when you paint, they paint snow, a good artist, the one that's, that's trying to represent the natural world as they see it. There'll be no white where they painted snow. It'll be blues and purples and yellows and yep. so on. And yet you see it as white snow. Yep. But more than that, um, it, it, the, the, the impression a lot of people have is that, oh, we have color receptors at the back of their eye, and when red's in the world, the red receptor it indicates that. And when blue's in the world, well, we actually don't have blue receptors, but when green's in the world, um, uh, the green receptor tells us. But that's not in fact that we see color at all. Um, that's not the mechanism underlying color vision, except for under extreme circumstances, if I put you in a completely dark room and give you a pure wavelength, then that's true. Okay. You'll see red when I show you red that, sh that makes the, the red receptors um, go off. Generally speaking, the way you see color is uh, in a color constancy sense, so that we could all agree, I'll walk into this room and go, yeah, that's beige. And yet if we measured it precisely, we might find that there's actually no browns coming off that surface at all. And this was work that Edmund Land did uh, in the early 60s, showing that in fact that's quite true. Even if all of us agree. Now, is that pareidolia? Because in fact, there is no brown there. And yet every single person who comes in says, oh, there's, yeah, definitely. And that's part of the reason I argued earlier that there is no color in the world. Yep. Color is something we bring to our interpretation of things. And, but it's not to say that it's not and why I say that is because evolutionarily speaking, look at things like berries. They go out of their way to make themselves a bright red to contrast with the green, so you'll eat them. Huh. Um, so it's some sense in the world too, but it's more of an act that you bring to the world. And I think that's true for, for most perception. It's a mistake to put it in the world, as much as we all agree on an approach. Don't remember, our important thing is that you get through the world without falling into holes. And bumping right? into things, Bumping yeah. into things and, and getting eaten by lions. Um, but that's it. What you 
what you perceive, what, what you construct to perceive, just has to meet those criteria. It doesn't really matter that it actually matches the world in any other sense. It just has to match the world so you can maneuver your way through it. Um, and which might be a good argument when you think about it yourself, that there's a good chance that maybe the way you perceive the world is nothing like how your dog does. Or, on the other hand, you could say, well, the tasks we have to solve are much the same, so maybe it would be the same. Okay, okay. So following from that, this course is about the science of everyday thinking. There are people out there who want to make better decisions, think better, and do better. Based on your research, what, in, what, what advice would you give them? Well, based on my research, aside from the obvious, you know, exercise, <laughs> good diet, get a good sleep. Is that what you research? Yeah. Yeah. No, my, I don't know what my research says about that. We do know that when you put yourself under conditions of um, sleep deprivation, um, ingesting certain chemicals, even common ones, alcohol and uh, tobacco and the like, um, and put yourself in high stress situations, uh, so your limbic system is, is going off, that we tend to increase the rate with which we're going to produce these errors. Yeah, okay. right? uh, we're now become more likely to see blankets as dogs and, and shadows as, as uh, uh, things that might threaten us. It makes good sense evolutionarily that you're in those situations you become much more, um, seeing the world is much more dangerous than it is. But, so part of it to make, to make good decisions, don't make them under conditions of high stress of lack of sleep under a high chemical arousal and those kinds of things to make a better decision about things. So maybe my research is something like that. Okay, so if you're going around the world, um, uh, when you're making your way through the world, be conscious of uh, the fact that, I'm trying to rephrase, I'm trying to rephrase what you said in, in terms of the person, in terms of what people can do. So you touched on it in the end. So. In order to make better decisions, be conscious of this, which will allow you to do that. What? Okay, I see what you're getting at. Um, I guess what I was talking about is that is that it's it's all an adjustable uh, criterion that you use to 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 decide that, that there's something there. I have to act, right? Um, so clearly, it, you're much better to to false alarm to tigers in the bush next to you than not than to, to miss so. it. Okay. Um, or North America here than bears, mm -hmm. right? Um, and they, therefore, if you're in a high stress situation that's late at night and you're all lost and so on, it, it's, it makes good sense that you're gonna see a lot of other things as bears, um, even though they're not. And it's not that you, you, you just come to the decision by stroking your chin going, okay, I think that's a bear. No, you see a bear, I mean, yeah. there's no question about that. Um, even though in some sense there's no bear there, but it's giving off enough cues that are consistent with the interpretation that that's a bear much like our backward messages, if they were consistent with the phrases that, that Don and I made up, lead you to that conclusion. But it's not like, it's not yes or no. Under the, I'm quite sure with our backward messages experiments, had we put people in highly stressed situations, they would hear them they would hear more, more yeah. right? Or if we put them in situations in which the cost went the other way, um, if you get one of these wrong, right, you, you will not complete the course. Yeah. Um, then there might be a lot less so if you liberal. So if you flipped the payoffs around, yes. the, the, the threshold might be different. Yeah, and make it so that, no, no, you really have to control this stuff. Don't make these kinds of errors. Then, yeah, I suspect they would go, no, I don't hear it's, you know, the, the, I saw a girl with a wheeze in her mouth, which is a stupid phrase anyway. I mean, they would come up with, and it's, and it's the way things actually work. It's, it's when you've accumulated, when you, when the system has accumulated enough evidence to go and has good reasons to do that, it goes. This, and it makes, makes some really good sense. So in that sense is what I was getting at. If you want to make good decisions in that kind of rational sense, but it actually makes sense to go with it. If you are in one of those situations that's late at night, it's dark, um, you're lost, uh, it does make good sense not to just assume there are no bears. I mean, seriously, right? Or when you're, if you're walking down the street, don't have $20 bills hanging out of your pockets to attract muggers. I mean, just even though you might do that normally. Gotcha. So, but, but because those mechanisms actually are life pre preserving and they've had been selected for, I presume, for, for tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of years, that's why you're here and others aren't because you chose your parents well. well. Yeah. So that part of what it is. So if you're thinking about, say, Danny Kahneman's recent book on thinking fast and slow, there are certain situations he outlines where the, the, the thinking fast really gets you into trouble. But it also many, many situations where it gets you out of trouble where thinking slow would not. So it's, there's not a simple panacea here. My name is John, I think about knowing.